alcohol-free drugs, I'm in. Where do I sign up? Playing faster and heavier than his hard rock heroes, he soon cobbled together a speed metal band called Panic. And through the group's small-time gigs, he glimpsed the first signs of salvation. I liked the power that it gave me. I was very power drunk from it, you know, and people knew my name and they wanted to hang around with me. And the quality of the girls were going up very rapidly. And I thought, this is great. At 17, Dave was his own man and afraid of nothing. In June of 78, he tracked down his father, John, and arranged to have a beer with him a few days later. But his father would never keep the appointment. I get a call from one of my sisters saying that he'd had an accident. My dad had a very serious aneurysm, and uh, no one knew how to get a hold of the family. So it was about two days before they finally got a hold of me, and by that time, it was too late to give permission to really do anything to help him. When Dave got the news from his sister, Suzanne, he was in the midst of a drinking binge. Still, he raced to the hospital. I rode on a moped with a bottle of old granddad in my pocket, drinking straight whiskey, running red lights. I showed up drunk. My sister, Suzanne, she looked at me, and she said, you're going to end up just like him. And I'll be damned if she wasn't right. John Mustaine died on June 23, 1978. But his death did nothing to slow his son's growing addictions. I'd already tried psychedelics, LSD, and mushrooms and stuff like that. And everything was legal to me because I answered to my own set of angels. When I realized I was a drug addict and an alcoholic, I didn't think, oh my God, I'm like Otis from Mandy and Mayberry, you know? I thought, oh my God, I'm Keith Richards. I'm James Dean. I'm cool. Within a year, Dave was freebasing cocaine and getting bored with panic. Then in the fall of 81, he saw a newspaper ad for a guitar player. It had been placed by a band called Metallica. There was an ad in there for uh, Lead Guitarist Wanted, uh, and they had said they were looking for someone influenced by, by Iron Maiden and Motorhead. I just got this phone call from this guy who basically just called up and started talking. I mean, after hello, I don't think I said anything for like the next 10 minutes. It was just going blah, 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 blah. So I go to audition for this band, and I took my amps and everything, and I plugged in, and I'm warming up. He had this shrieking lead sound that would cut through any soundproofing. <laughs> everything just was exploding out of everywhere of him. I said, well, are we going to audition? And they said, no, you got the job. Dave Mustaine believed he'd finally found a place in the world where he fit in. But his sanctuary would be short-lived. Next, Mustaine and Metallica duke it out. He was on a road to killing possibly all of us at one point. And later, Dave's dance with death. It took me to an emergency room, and then I died. In the fall of 81, future Megadeth frontman Dave Mustaine finally found an artful outlet for his aggression with Metallica. The band was at the cutting edge of a musical revolution called Thrash, a fusion of punk rock and hardcore heavy metal. It was angst and testosterone driven about anarchy and things like that. Four of us were the detonation, the beginning of something that was going to really affect music forever. With songs like Jump in the Fire, Metallica cranked up the oral anger of seminal metal bands like Motorhead, clashing head-on with the glam groups dominating the L.A. music scene. So tell me what you think about glam rock. To me, glam rock stands... Glam means gay L.A. music. Grown up in LA and saw all of the BS rock star podium, you know, big wig hairdo stuff, and we were so against any of that. Would you please go up Metallica! Metallica spent a year perfecting their sonic jabs in clubs and studios, proving that their bad boy image was no act. 
When I would go to rehearsal, I would leave the dogs there to watch the drugs. And, and one, one day I took one of the dogs with me and she put her paws up on Ron McGovney's car and scratched the front panel. The pit bull started jumping on my car, scratching it all up. And I hear James yelling at, at Dave saying, hey, get your, your freaking dogs off of Ron's car. And James kicked the dog. Now everyone thinks I kicked James' dog and it wasn't that way. James kicked my dog and that's where we went, don't do this, oh, don't do this or you're gonna get fired. And I hear James yelling at, at Dave, and all of a sudden Dave just came unglued. Don't you say this kind of crap about my dogs? Then they're nose to nose. Shut up or I'm going to hit you. And then the bass player goes, you hit him, you're going to have to hit me first. And then James goes, you hit him, you're going to have to hit me first. And I said, you win, James. And I belted him in the mouth. Knocked him across the room. I mean, just, I mean, he wasn't even expecting it. And the bass player jumped me, and I flipped him. He threw me against the wall like a big judo throw. And we just got him to get out of here, you're out of the band, you know? All right, F you, blah, blah, blah. And he goes in, packs up all his stuff, leaves, comes back the next day. Can I be back in the band? You go, all right, okay, you're back in the band. Dave was uh, pretty much a Jekyll and Hyde. That started perpetuating the Dave's an asshole rumor because as far as anybody knew, I was just a, you know, a badass on guitar that liked to fight and drink. Well, it just got worse. Uh, I wasn't home one time, and Dave was sitting there drinking, and my bass was on a guitar stand, and he decided to take a whole beer and just pour it right into the pickups on my bass, just down the whole thing in there. I didn't know anything about it. Go plug it in. It about blew me across the room. It shocked the hell out of me. I told Dave, look, you guys get the F out of my house. James, get out. You're going to have to leave. I mean, that's it. I can't take it anymore. Within weeks, McGovney was out of the band. He just was not dangerous, you know? If you're gonna be in Metallica, you're four badass. It's not, you know, three men and a baby, you know? They came in the U-Haul, loaded up their stuff, and they were off to San Francisco. Metallica moved their angry act to San Francisco and hired bass player Cliff Burton. The city by the bay soon became heavy metal headquarters. There were gods in San Francisco. We're selling three, 4,000 tickets to shows. They were legends before they ever released a record. We felt a lot more comfortable up there, and the whole flashy side of L.A. just wasn't so prominent up there, you know? On stage, Dangerous Dave was part of Metallica's instant attraction. I believe you have a middle finger! <laughs> Dave was outspoken, did a lot of talking into the microphone, which I thought was very unusual for a guy who was not singing at all. He was playing the role of bad boy. Uh, and he, he played it well. I mean, he was a pretty scary guy. It seemed to me like I was the leader of the band because I had big balls and I wasn't going to take shit from anybody. Metallica quickly drew allegiance from an underground army of angst-ridden teens already armed with the sounds of the new wave of British heavy metal. We were all followers of the new wave of British heavy metal. Metallica's music was kind of like these groups, but Americanized, more powerful, more straightforward. I had never heard like such a twin rhythm guitar kind of deal going on. Their music just had more speed or something to it, and it blew me away. So you couldn't read about it in, in mainstream magazines. You couldn't hear it on the radio. There certainly was no MTV or, or videos or VH1. It was really about a network. By the beginning of 1983, Metallica had punched out a seven-song demo tape, No Life to Leather, that quickly became legendary in the American metal underground. What the music was speaking about, the lyrics and the lifestyle, that really hit home to a lot of kids for that time period. We are you and you are us. On the No Life to Leather demo, James says, we are Metallica, you are Metallica. And that was sort of the ethic that lived, you know, with all these fans and all these bands. That March, aspiring metal manager Johnny Zazula heard the tape and convinced Metallica to move to New York. Are you planning to do any recording soon? Rochester, New York. With James Hetfield's pickup in tow, Metallica hit the road in a U-Haul. The back went down and you were locked in there and whatever happened back there, you know, if you could afford a flashlight, you were king, you know? But there was no light, no anything back there. You just get rotted and sleep, you know, hopefully. You hope the gear didn't fall and crush you. While I was in the back of this truck, rust came down from the ceiling and got in my eyes. I said, I gotta get to an emergency room because I've got metal shavings in my eyes. And they didn't want to stop till we got to Old Bridge. Dave's dark side soon got the best of him. 